influenced the course of Western history more than any other. Our advisors all suggested that we ask Martha Himmelfarb to give this lecture. It is with special pleasure that I introduce Professor Himmelfarb to you because she is a longtime colleague of my spouse in the religion department and a good friend. Martha joined the religion department in 1978 as she was completing her graduate work at the University of Pennsylvania. She is currently serving as the chair of the department, a fact which led me to be very reluctant to ask her, but she was gracious and agreed to come. <laughs> Professor Himmelfarb's research interests are in ancient Judaism I love the titles of our first two books. The first one, Tours of Hell, an Apocalyptic Form in Jewish and Christian Literature. And the second one, Ascent to Heaven in Jewish and Christian Apocalypses. She has a forthcoming book entitled The Kingdom of Priests, Ancestry and Merit in Second Temple Judaism. She has served several roles in the Society of Biblical her title tonight is entitled, her lecture tonight is entitled, The Book of Moses, the Torah as Text in Antiquity. Please welcome Martha Himmelfarb. Israel. 
and he did this in the public square where everybody could see him. Isaiah named his sons strange names. Um, the spoil speeds, the prey hastens to get across his message of what he saw coming for the people of Israel. Uh, the, the words of these prophets, as they've come down to us, bear the marks of their oral origins. Um, they are poetic. There are in, 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 in Biblical Hebrew, the way you identify poetry is not by rhyme or even by meter. I mean, there might have been meter, but nobody seems too sure about it. You identify by parallelism, by a kind of very subtle repetition. Um, Hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth. You say the same thing twice, only you're not saying quite the same thing. Um, anyway, if you, if you look at Amos or Hosea or Isaiah, you will see that most of those books uh, consist of words that clearly in, in, in Hebrew or poetry. Um, and that's quite suggestive, that kind of parallel. We don't know when those words were written down um, or how they reached the people who eventually did write them down. Was there, was there someone following the prophets around and jotting down those words? Um, I'll, I'll talk in a couple of minutes about Jeremiah, a prophet who did have a scribe following him around. But we don't know for Amos and Hosea and Isaiah and others. Or were the words passed on orally for many generations until perhaps during the exile, at the same time that the Torah took written form, those words were written down? We really don't know. Uh, what I want to do tonight is to look at how we get Judaism, the religion of the book, or more modestly and more precisely, to look at the process by which we move from this kind of oral situation to the moment when written texts emerge as a source of religious authority in roughly two centuries, uh, from the last quarter of the seventh century BCE, uh, the, the last half century of independence for Judah, the surviving Israelite kingdom, to the middle of the fifth century BCE, when Judah had become a Persian province, the province of Yehud. Um, so roughly the years be a little more precise about the beginning point, 622, because of an event that I'm about to read uh, to you from, from the Book of Kings. Uh, this is from 2 Kings. It's not on your handout. Um, then we'll get to the handout at the end uh, of the evening, but um, I'm going to start with a passage from 2 Kings that describes uh, the finding of the book. 22.8. Shortly before the 
scholars have long argued that this book of the Torah discovered in the temple, and the word discovered, as you might guess, should probably be in quotation marks. Uh, it appears that the finding of this book was part of a program of reform already underway. The fact that work was going on in the temple shows us that King Josiah was attempting to get rid of the idolatrous practices that his grandfather, Manasseh, had introduced into the temple to cleanse the temple, to rebuild the temple, and that that book was part of his program, part of the program of uh, Hilkiah the high priest and the king's other advisors. Now, people argue that that book was the fifth book of the Torah, the book of Deuteronomy, something like the book of Deuteronomy as we know it today, for several reasons. Uh, what Josiah does after he reads the book, um, in, in the passage just after the one I read to you, um, we hear in very concrete terms about what Josiah undertakes as a result of the reading of the book. He gets rid of all the high places, the local holy sites where sacrifices were offered and where there were so many of them that it was impossible for the king or the high priest in Jerusalem to supervise. So they suspected, probably rightly, that the worship taking place at those high places did not meet their high standards of monotheism, that it was not just the Lord who worshiped there, but perhaps also the queen of heaven and other local gods. Uh, they didn't like that. They got rid of the high places, and they insisted, and Deuteronomy is the only book of the Torah to insist, that the only place sacrifice could legitimately be offered was in the Jerusalem temple. Obviously, they are subject to supervision by the high priest. The royal uh, bureaucracy could make sure that it was done as, as they thought right. Uh, there are also some very significant um, points of contact in terminology. Uh, I, I read you um, the, the phrase, book of the Torah, book of the law, in the account of the discovery. Um, and the summary of Josiah's career, we hear about the Torah of Moses. Um, uh, Second Kings tells us about Josiah. Before him, there was no king like him. Turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to all the Torah of Moses. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy refers to itself as the Torah of Moses. This is the Torah, the teaching. Torah literally means the Hebrew root it comes from means teaching. Very early, the word is translated into Greek as law because it's come to be associated with those five books which contain a great deal of law. And that translation, uh, because of its history in Christianity, comes to have a huge influence on um, the, tra the tradition of English Bible translation. But law is, I mean, it's not a wrong translation, but it doesn't get, I think, the full range of meaning. I think teaching is really better. Uh, Deuteronomy refers to itself as the Torah of Moses. This is the Torah that Moses placed before the children of Israel. Or Moses wrote this Torah, this teaching. Uh, or the phrase, the book of the Torah, the book of the teaching. Uh, this, these, this phrase, these phrases appear uh, in Deuteronomy and only in Deuteronomy of the books of the Torah. So I think there's really a strong case to be made that the book that Josiah and Hilkiah found in the temple, found in the temple, and then published by reading aloud to the people, that this book is something like the book of Deuteronomy as we know. Now, for us, the idea that a book can have authority is obvious. I mean, that written texts have authority is just something we take for granted. Uh, but as far as we can tell, Deuteronomy is the first work of what will come to be the Bible that took book form, that actually got written down. Um, and that, I think, is very, why that happens is what I want to try to worry about. Before I do, I want to I want to point out that Deuteronomy something was going on around the time that Deuteronomy was discovered. I, I've already pointed out that the early prophets were speakers rather than writers, um, and I mentioned Jeremiah 
who had a scribe following him around. Jeremiah was a contemporary of King Josiah. They were roughly the same age. Uh, and Jeremiah prophesied from shortly before the publication of Deuteronomy through the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians and the destruction of the temple in 586. So he started prophesying probably around 627, but just, just before the finding of Deuteronomy, and he was active through the destruction of the temple. We learn from his book that he was accompanied in his work by a scribe, a man named Baruch, who wrote down his words. And one story about those written words, I think, is particularly um, revealing. Uh, it turns out that the activity of writing in Jeremiah's life, anyway, uh, played an important role not only for future readers of the book, who may owe the fact that we've got it at least in part to Burroughs' activity, um, but also uh, it, it permitted Jeremiah to present his words to the people and then to King Jehoiakim, the son of King Josiah, without actually being present. His words could be written. He didn't need to be there when the words were heard by others, um, and we learn that this probably saved Jeremiah's life. Um, we, we learn from the book of Jeremiah that in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, probably 604 BCE, um, some prophecies of doom that Jeremiah had been prophesying in the temple um, created quite a stir. Jeremiah was prohibited from appearing in the temple as a result. Um, so he sent Baruch with a scroll on which Baruch had written down Jeremiah's dictation, Jeremiah's most recent pro prophecies uh, of doom, in the hopes of encouraging the people of Jerusalem to repent. Um, some members of the royal court, we learn, heard Baruch reading this scroll, and they were very impressed. They were so impressed that they wanted to read the scroll to the king. But they also were a little nervous about how the king was going to react. So before going to the king, they urged both Jeremiah and Baruch to go into hiding. Then one of the courtiers took the scroll and read it before King Jehoiakim. And the narrative in the book of Jeremiah tells us that as the scroll was read, the king would cut off the columns that had already been read and toss them into the fire. It was winter time. There was a fire burning. Obviously, so much for repentance, right? It didn't have quite the effect that, that those courtiers were hoping. Uh, but at the very least, it did save, probably save the lives of Jeremiah and Baruch, who otherwise might have ended up by, you know, tossed into the fire. I'm not quite sure what. But clearly, the king was in no mood for what they had to say. So the, 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 the scroll allows Jeremiah's word to be present, even when Jeremiah what is more, it's really interesting, the scroll can be reproduced. I mean, if, jo if Jehoiakim thought he was getting rid of Jeremiah's prophecies of doom that way, he was wrong. Um, we're told that after Jeremiah learned the fate of the scroll, he dictated all the words to Baruch once again, and this time he added even some more prophecies of doom. Uh, so the written word really, uh, in that story, plays a very kind of practical role by permitting the message of the prophet to be heard without the prophet having to actually be present. Now, Deuteronomy does something similar, you might say in an even more kind of innovative or imaginative way. The book of Deuteronomy makes Moses' words present without Moses, and indeed Moses has probably been dead for many centuries by the time Deuteronomy takes shape. And the standard scholarly view is that um, while well, Deuteronomy was published in 622, it probably took shape in the century before. Not, maybe it wasn't finished until just before 622, but the traditions in it seem to date from the previous century. Yet Deuteronomy presents itself as Moses' farewell address to the people of Israel just before his death and their entry into the land. And it, the rhetoric of Deuteronomy plays very hard on the idea that it's Moses addressing the, the people of Israel who had traveled through the wilderness with him. Uh, repeatedly, the Moses of Deuteronomy says to his audience, your eyes have seen what the Lord did 
uh, to the Egyptians. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did as we traveled through the wilderness. But I think this is technique that draws the actual audience of Deuteronomy's own day into a kind of identification with the generation of the wilderness that had, had itself experienced God's wonders. Um, so too, although Deuteronomy's laws, the distinctive laws of Deuteronomy, I've already said this, involve centralizing the cult in Jerusalem, no sacrifice except in Jerusalem, Deuteronomy never calls Jerusalem by name. Rather, it refers to the place your God, the Lord your God will choose. Because of course, for Moses to talk about Jerusalem would be anachronistic. Moses didn't yet know that when the people entered the land, the city that God would choose would be Jerusalem. So there's a really kind of self-conscious effort to make the words of Deuteronomy appropriate words to come out of the mouth of Moses. It's not just that the figure of Moses is tacked on to a kind of pre-existing uh, uh, exhortation and set of laws. Uh, but the authors of Deuteronomy were sensitive enough to also introduce rhetoric that spoke to the audience they were actually addressing. Uh, you know, on the one hand, they encourage them to identify with the generation of the Exodus. On the other hand, they must have realized that identification could never be complete. And they also try to help later generations connect to those events of the past. Um, they, they, God says to Moses, um, when in time to come, your son asks you, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the ordinances which the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. So for the generation uh, of the publication of Deuteronomy, you know, part of the time they could identify with those whose eyes had actually seen, but then Deuteronomy offers them another way to connect to that past. When your son asks, the generation that didn't experience it, and it, and it tries to address the needs of that generation, that that kind of uh, very subtle rhetorical um, uh, artistry is really possible only in writing. Um, you can't, you couldn't have had somebody addressing the people of Israel um, of, of in, in six twenty, the people of Jerusalem in six twenty two, pretending to be Moses. That simply wouldn't have worked. You needed a written document that could claim to preserve words spoken by Moses so many centuries ago. Well, saying, you know, explaining what writing allows doesn't really answer the question of why writing emerges. I mean, and and I, think, I think the figure of Baruch and the role of writing the book of Jeremiah and it's um, coming at just the same time as the book of Deuteronomy suggests that there is something about the historical moment that lent itself to this new role for writing, for the written text. Um, to be sure, writing itself in ancient Israel was not new. It had long been used for uh, royal record keeping, for diplomacy, and, and in a more primitive way for commercial purposes, and all of this for, for, for a very long time. Um, but commercial literacy is a pretty limited kind of literacy. You know how you need to know how to do accounts, <coughs> maybe, and, and make lists, um, but it doesn't involve prose composition. Um, royal records and diplomacy are much more elaborate um, writing and reading skills, but these were in the hands of professional experts, scribes, secretaries, who were trained to be able to, uh, to undertake these kinds of tasks. But, but for some reason, I, I, I'll try to give you a couple of possibilities in a minute, but it, for some reason, around the middle of the seventh century, we begin to get evidence of a growth of literacy outside those professionals, and a kind of literacy that does go beyond that very limited sort of commercial literacy. Uh, one example, we start, archaeologists find in this period, seals, um, you seal your letter, and an identifying seal, and before this, seals tended to have pictures as well as letters on them. Uh, around the middle of the seventh century, you begin to get seals with letters alone, which suggests that letters were now enough. You no longer needed a picture and a name, 
just the name would do. People, that was, that was people, there were enough people out there who could make sense of the name for that to work as a seal. We begin to get graffiti. Now, when you get graffiti um, in, in antiquity, people often assume that the person writing, uh, writing on the wall or the stone, wherever it is, um, is one of those professionally literate people, a scribe, a secretary, who has a few spare moments and uh, scrawls on the wall. But there's, there's one very interesting graffito uh, from the middle of the seventh century um, in a, a stone tomb in a place called Curvet Telecom. And there it's the, the tomb cutter himself who asks for a blessing on his completion of the task. So there's someone we wouldn't assume to be professionally literate who's able to write asking for a blessing. Uh, there's a wonderful find from this time, um, uh, an ostracani, uh, a pottery shirt um, written on, um, with a letter from a kind of junior officer to his commanding officer. And he says, uh, please explain to your servant the meaning of the letter which you sent to your servant yesterday evening, uh, because the heart of your servant has been sick since you're sending to your servant. Because my Lord said, you do not know how to read a letter. So this low-ranking officer writes to his commanding officer to say how distressed he is by the superior officer's accusation in writing that he doesn't know how to read. Now, um, scholars have pointed out that the letter from this junior officer is not, in fact, very well written, and that he might have done well to get a scribe to help him with it. But it's very interesting, not just because he does have the ability to put a letter together, whether you know, it meets high standards or not is a different question, but that he seems to view literacy as something desirable, not in a kind of professional situation where it would be required you know, a, a diplomatic corps, but even for a junior officer um, in, in, in the army. So uh, something really interesting is going on um, in the middle of the seventh century. Um, why should that have been? And I'll just give you briefly some elements of an explanation. I don't think they constitute a complete explanation. Um, the northern kingdom, there are two Israelite kingdoms. The northern kingdom, the more prosperous and powerful one, as long as the two both existed, um, fell to the Assyrians at the end of the 8th century BC, around 722, um, about a century, almost exactly a century before the publication of Deuteronomy. And with its fall, the southern kingdom began to come into its own, uh, in part because it received many refugees from the northern kingdom. Um, there is a move to a greater urbanization um, in the southern kingdom after the fall of the northern, northern kingdom. Greater centralization of um, the royal bureaucracy expands even before Josiah and Deuteronomic reform in 622, which as we've seen involves really significant centralization, even before that under under King Hezekiah at the turn of the, uh, of the 8th to the 7th century was a move toward centralization. Uh, so a growing and expanding royal bureaucracy and greater urbanization together are certainly preconditions for a growth in literacy. I don't know that they're a full explanation, but they certainly you know, give us at least some clues about why. Uh, what I really want to focus on, though, is not an attempt to, to explain the rise of literacy, uh, but really um, to describe the implications of this rise of literacy, or rather of the text, the authoritative text that emerge, I think, as a result of the new, <coughs> of the new place of reading and writing. Um, the implications, in my view, are actually quite radical, though I'm not sure that the purveyors of these written texts were really conscious of how radical they were. Um, it seems to me that the written text poses a challenge to all three types of traditional authority, uh, all, that, all three types of authority that were traditional in ancient Israel, the authority of the king, the authority of prophets, and the authority of priests. Uh, and that ultimately, it leads to the emergence of a new type of authority, that is the authority of the scribe, the expert interpreter of the text. Uh, let me begin with the king, and here finally we'll turn to the handout. Um, the book of Deuteronomy includes what scholars usually refer to as the law of the king. 
This is uh, chapter 17, starting in verse 14, the first column of that. When you come to the land which the Lord your God gives you, you see it's spoken from Moses' point of view, so it's in the future, supposedly, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around about me. You may indeed set a king over you, uh, oh, you may indeed set his king over you, him whom the Lord your God will choose. Again, as if it's all in the future. And of course, there's a debate within biblical thought about whether Israel really should have had a king. After all, God was the king. But Deuteronomy seems to have made its peace with the idea of kingship, even though not necessarily with a specific king. So you have to pick a brother, not a foreigner, to be king. Then, verse 16. Only, he must not multiply forces for himself, or cause the people to return to Egypt. In order to multiply horses, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. So I think that means you can't have too big an army. And he shall not multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Nor shall he greatly multiply for himself silver and gold. Uh, clearly the king they have in mind here is Solomon, you know, David's son, great king, but at the end of his life, as uh, we learn in the book, Kings edited by the same school responsible for the book of Deuteronomy um, in his old age, after having amassed all those riches, um, having built his palace and built the temple for the Lord, um, Solomon's many wives, his hundreds of wives, um, eventually led him into idolatry. Some of them were, were fine princesses, um, and he allowed them to worship their own gods, and in his old age, he followed them into idolatry, um, and that explains of uh, the Bible, why uh, the one kingdom, the united kingdom of David and Solomon turned into those two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. So I think we're getting a critique of Solomon. But then what's most interesting for us is, and when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, this is the future king, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this Torah, I'm going to translate, from that which is in the charge of the Levitical priests, and it shall be with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping the words of this Torah and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brethren, and that he may not turn aside from the command either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children. Well, this I think is really quite an amazing thing in a document uh, whose patron was uh, not only the high priest Hilkiah, but King Josiah. Uh, according to this passage in Deuteronomy, the king is subordinate to the Torah, and by the Torah, as we've seen, Deuteronomy clearly means itself. The king has to obey the laws of, this, of the Torah of Moses, he must follow them, he must not turn aside left or right. His power has limits on it, and as a way of enacting his acknowledgement of the limits on his power, he is to copy the Torah himself. He is to make a copy of it himself so that he will sort of internalize those restrictions. Uh, as I said, I think it's really remarkable that a king would have uh, stood behind a text that placed this kind of limit on really, I think, a sign of piety on his part. Now, the implications of this uh, passage in Deuteronomy, I think, never were fully felt, because it's not that long from 622 to 586 and the fall of the kingdom. And as we've seen, uh, Josiah's son, Jehoiakim, who cut up um, the words of Jeremiah, doesn't seem like the kind of king who would have allowed um, the the Torah of Moses to stand in the way of what he wanted to do. Uh, still, it, 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 this passage, I think, does prepare us uh, for the role that the Torah comes to play uh, under Persian patronage um, as the law of the constitution of, you might say, the province of Yehud, the, the province around Jerusalem, uh, imposed or authorized by the Persians um, after the return from exile, um, the Persians um, sometime in the middle of the 5th century want to make sure that they know exactly what the law of those Jews is, 
Um, and they insist on getting the Torah down, right? Um, for them, by that time, the Torah means all five books. And it's really interesting that it's under uh, the patronage of a foreign empire that the Torah as a whole becomes the kind of constitution of, of the Jewish people. But you can see the beginning of that process, I think, in the law of the king in Deuteronomy. Okay, so I, I think it's clear how Deuteronomy, the written text, presents a challenge to the power of the king. Um, I think the written text is also a challenge to the power of prophets. Now, we saw in the case of Jeremiah how prophecy and writing went hand in hand. Um, but let me give you a couple of examples of how, um, how prophecy is transformed and ultimately abolished because of the role of the text. Uh, the prophet Ezekiel uh, prophesied from just before the destruction to <coughs> and after it, by, or before and after 586, describes his reception of God's prophetic words, not in terms of hearing God's voice, but in terms of swallowing a scroll. And I think that really reveals his self-consciousness of the role the text and writing took in his prophecy. Um, whereas Hosea and Isaiah perform their signs in public, like Jeremiah <coughs> too, in downtown Jerusalem, Jeremiah marched around with a yoke on his shoulders, Ezekiel does something rather different. He, as a sign of the punishment of the northern kingdom, he lies on his left side, he tells us, for 390 days. As a sign of the punishment God has in store for the southern kingdom, he lies on his right side for 40 days. How would anybody have known about these signs if he didn't write about them and have somebody read the description elsewhere? He would have had to come to Ezekiel's house to see these signs be. So writing is really central to Ezekiel's prophecy in a way that it isn't, even for Jeremiah, for all that Baruch plays an important role. After the, the, the exile, the return from exile, the end of the 6th century, we get the prophecies of Zechariah. And there we see something very interesting. Um, Zechariah's prophecy um, really represents a, a very uh, important new kind of development. The typical mode of prophecy in the early prophets is oral, an oral AU and oral with an O. Um, the prophets hear and hear God's word and they speak. Um, occasional reference to a vision, but very little, a little bit Amos, a little bit Jeremiah. Zechariah's prophecy takes place through visions, and if they're not simple visions. Quite complex visions, and in fact, Zechariah needs an angel to interpret the visions for him. And I think this is really a sign of the kind of textualization of prophecy. You see a vision, and it needs to be explicated just as a text needs to be explicated. And, and I would argue that in the end, prophecy disappears sometime in the fourth or third century, or this respectable prophecy disappears in considerable part because of the weight of the authoritative text, the, the Torah in particular. Um, as Deuteronomy has Moses insist, you shall not add to it or take away from it. Well, prophecy would have been added to it. Once you've got a text in place that doesn't want to be added to, prophecy becomes a much more problematic undertaking. Uh, the authority of priests is also compromised by the written um, I mentioned a moment ago that the Torah became the law of the land under Persian rule, the Torah, the, the full five books. The Persians sent um, a Jewish scribe, a priest by ancestry, who was also a Persian civil servant, um, Ezra, to Yehud, to the province of Yehud, in the middle of the fifth century BCE, to establish the Torah as the law of the land, um, probably because they were worried about um, threat from Egypt that required strengthening their defenses along the Mediterranean coast. So they wanted to stabilize the internal situation. That's what people speculate. It's hard to imagine why they would be too worried about the specifics of the laws of the Jews. The Persians tended to allow minorities a lot of um, internal autonomy, but this mission of Ezra seems to reflect some, some concern for the stability of, of the 
Now, the account in the book of Ezra, uh, rather the book of Nehemiah, Ezra's, uh, well, Ezra's successor, describes Ezra reading the Torah aloud to the assembled people of Yehud and attempting to institute reforms based on it. Um, Ezra is succeeded by a Jewish governor of Yehud. Ezra doesn't seem to have been the governor. He seems to have been the emissary of the Persian crown. Um, Nehemiah, his successor, is actually the governor. He started out as the king's cupbearer, and his book tells us that uh, he heard bad news. He heard that things were going badly in Jerusalem and Yehud, and because of his close relationship with the, with the Persian king, he requested that he be sent to put things in order. Uh, and he was a real take-charge guy. Um, Ezra arrives in Jerusalem, and he finds out the men of Jerusalem have taken far and wide, and he tears out his hair in horror at this news. Um, Nehemiah comes to town, and when he hears the same thing, as he tells us in um, his um, account of his achievements at the end of the book, when Nehemiah hears that the men of Jerusalem have taken far and wide, he pulls out their hair. And I always think that really characterizes the difference between them. Um, Nehemiah really gets things done. Um, anyway, the passage that I want to to look at with you, um, the, the second passage on the handout, comes from Nehemiah's list of his <coughs> achievements. Uh, on that day, they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. For they did not meet the children of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. So it's referring back to an incident of um, the <coughs> travels through the wilderness and the language of this passage. No Ammonite or Moabite should enter the assembly of God um, because they didn't meet the children of Israel with bread and water alludes to um, a passage um, in, in Deuteronomy um, chapter 23. Um, when the people heard the law, this is verse 3, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. So when they heard this read from Deuteronomy, I guess it comes as news to them. Uh, obviously not. Um, Nehemiah claims they got rid of all the presumably foreign wives and other foreigners among them. So there, Nehemiah seems to suggest an interpretation of the passage in Deuteronomy. No Ammonite or Moabite should enter the assembly of that the assembly of God means the community of Israel. No foreigners, no people descended from Ammon or Moab, um, two neighboring countries, um, neighboring ethnic groups who certainly have close relations with the people of, of Jerusalem, and we are told that um, these foreign wives included Ammonite and Moabite women, uh, that none, no Ammonite or Moabite should join the people. Then he goes on to report another incident that seems to suggest a different understanding of assembly of God. Now before this, Eliashib the priest, he was indeed the high priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God and who was connected with Tobiah, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the cereal offering and so on. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem. Since I'd gone home, when I came back to Jerusalem, Seven, I discovered the evil that Eliashim had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. Now what you need to know, and what you would know if you've been reading the book of Nehemiah up to this point, Nehemiah doesn't mention it again here, is that Tobiah's last, Tobiah's um, epithet in Nehemiah, in the book of Nehemiah, is Tobiah the Ammonite. And I was very angry and I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I gave orders, and they cleansed the chambers, and I brought back thither the, ves the vessels of the house of God. So what happened here? Obviously, a different, a second interpretation of assembly of God. Nehemiah hears the passage in Deuteronomy. He obviously knew the passage, but he's, he's relying on it very heavily here. No Ammonite in the assembly of God, meaning the temple, the place where the people assemble to worship God. And Nehemiah overrules the high priest. 
tells us the high priest was connected with, me, with Tobiah. We learn later that the high priest's grandson was married to Tobiah's daughter. That the high priest has no right to have Tobiah in the temple because it says in Deuteronomy, no Ammonite or Moabite in the assembly of God. Now, I'm sure the husbands of the women uh, who had to leave because of Nehemiah's uh, insistence on Deuteronomy were not too happy about it. But Eliashib, the high priest, must have been utterly appalled. Who was Nehemiah to tell him, the high priest, how to run the temple? It was his temple. His fathers had run the temple for gen back for countless generations. How dare someone, even the Persian governor, who was not himself of priestly ancestry, how dare Nehemiah tell him how to run? Well, Nehemiah gets away with it. I mean, Nehemiah can toss all that furniture out the window because he's got the power of the Persian crown behind him. He is, after all, a Persian governor. But that's not what he says. That's not how he justifies himself. He doesn't say, I am the state. I can do what I want. He justifies his interference as she certainly would have seen it, by referring to the book of Moses. He could trump the high priest, and he could claim that he was being more pious than the high priest because there was a written document that anybody who could read, and that's not a lot of people, but that anybody who could read could refer to. The priest couldn't say, well, you might think no Ammonites are allowed, but my grandfather always said Ammonites are allowed, you don't know. There was a document that said no Ammonites. And that, I think, is absolutely central for the future of, of, of Judaism. OK, well, let me conclude. Um, the, I, I've said that the written text uh, undercuts the authority, the traditional authority of king, prophet, and priest. It lends authority to a new role, the role of scribe. Ezra is actually called a scribe. Nehemiah is not called a scribe, but in the incident I've just recounted, two incidents, he certainly acts like one, um, offering at least an implicit interpretation of a passage in the Torah. Now remember, the text may be authoritative, but after all, it's only a text. It doesn't act on its own, and it can be quite ambiguous. It needs someone to interpret it to explain how it applies to contemporary situations, um, exactly what Nehemiah is doing. Nehemiah's interpretation, as we saw, is quite straightforward. Um, interesting, a double interpretation of that phrase, but pretty straightforward. Um, certainly, um, in centuries to come, um, much more elaborate interpretations will develop. Um, the rabbis ultimately come to the view that uh, the whole of the Torah was direct divine revelation, that not only the words of the Torah were meaningful, but even letters were meaningful, and not only the letters, but even the flourishes with which the letters were written, that even those flourishes were full of meaning. Uh, that, that's many centuries later, and it took a lot of development to get there, but it seems to me that the crucial moment for those developments is that, well, not quite two centuries that we've just been looking at, and that with Nehemiah, the dynamics of the religion of text and commentary 
Hebrew Bible um, are from the 9th or 10th centuries of this era. Um, Greek, we actually have manuscripts of the Greek Bible that are quite a bit earlier, from maybe 4th century of this era, complete manuscripts. With the Dead Sea Scrolls, we've got, we've, we've got some significant fragments of um, the Hebrew Bible from the turn of the era, um, from maybe as far back as the 2nd century. CE, but nothing resembling um, a, a complete book there, some, some long passages. And one of the interesting things that the Dead Sea Scrolls have shown us is that there's quite a lot of textual fluidity still in the first centuries um, you know, of BCE. Um, by the time you get to the, the, the medieval Hebrew manuscripts, um, they've really done a very impressive job of standardizing the text. And they did this, it's very interesting, they did this um, by a very elaborate process of um, copyist rules. And for example, um, you find notes in these medieval Hebrew manuscripts, um, halfway through the book of Genesis in verses, a little later, halfway through the book of Genesis in words. So obviously somebody's counting to make sure you've got all the right, you know, the right number of words. Uh, or you'll come to an unusual word and there'll be a note saying, this word appears also in, you know, name another biblical book where it appears, as a sign, I think, to, the, to other copyists, mm -hmm. don't think that you know, there's something wrong with this word and you need to change it, this really is an unusual word, but it appears somewhere else also. But they really did an excellent job, which is, you know, from a scholar's point of view, actually too bad, because you've, you know, you've lost a lot of the interesting variation that might reveal something about um, you know, the very ancient stages of the text, but it's really not until the Middle Ages that we've got complete Hebrew manuscripts. I hope that answered your question. I hope I understood the question. Then they continued along that line. Was there punctuation? No. No, no punctuation. And then it had to be inferred when a thought stopped and a new That book. That's right. There were no, there were no uh, verse divisions. Not even, not even chapter divisions, no punctuation. Um, Hebrew doesn't have capital letters. Um, it's a challenge. But you could say that all Torahs now are identical? Yes, unless there is a mistake in it. Yes. Yes. I mean, it's actually it's interesting. I don't know if, you, if you've ever seen what a, what a Torah scroll looks like today. I mean, it's, you know, it's a very elaborate process copy one, and um, the scribes who do it are specially trained, and they can, it's still done on parchment, and um, takes a long time to write one, and the, you know, the letters still have those little flourishes. And, you know, periodically the scroll needs to be taken in for repair because something will wear away and the letter won't look quite right, or the scribe, someone will discover that the scribe actually made a mistake. So, um, you know, something like the ancient processes in work, the difference is that um, there's now a standard you know, to, to check against, which there, there certainly there wasn't in quite the same way in antiquity. Yes? When you say that, that there's an indication of substantial fluidity we get from looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls, you draw a lot of inferences, though, from um, things that are written, that presumably were written back in talking about doesn't really undermine that confidence because it's not it's not so fluid you know there'll be some interesting variations on words um, there are there are some books where there's more fluidity than others the text of the Torah not much from from very early on I think because it was recognized as the authoritative text par excellence the thing that they should make you nervous about whether it goes back to the to the seventh or sixth century is really the process of editing um, you know, let me give you one very striking example. Um, the prophet Amos is probably the earliest prophet we've got, prophesying middle of the 8th century in the Northern Kingdom, all doom, um, eight and a half chapters worth of doom. The last four verses of the book, five verses of the book, um, have a very comforting message. And even though Amos has been prophesying in the Northern Kingdom, the, the last five verses address 
um, the restoration of the House of David, which was in the southern kingdom. So <coughs> scholars argue, I think very persuasively, that um, somebody put the Book of Amos in its final form and couldn't bear how, you know, how hard, how full of doom the message was. They had to add a little bit of something to cheer them up during the exile to address the southerners who had lost the House of David. It was actually did a nice job, picked up some of the language of Amos to do it. Now, okay, we've identified those five verses, but you know, it does make you a little nervous. What else is there in the book of Amos that somebody else put in? The book of Isaiah. Uh, three different moments in history, I mean, at least three different prophets, a lot of editorial work. So, I mean, there were, it's really more the question of transmission and editing that gets you down to. I think by the turn of the era, by the time of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the books were more or less as we know them. You know, some fluidity, but more or less as we know them. But really, we do need to worry about what was going on in that, you know, in that other period. I mean, for Deuteronomy, um, I said cautiously that you know the text that was read by Josiah was something like the Book of Deuteronomy we've got. But obviously, that something like is rather important. You know, how how did that book develop from its first form in 622 to the form we've gotten, that's, a hard, that's very hard to get at. So, I mean, you're, you're right that we, you know, we don't have any really firm idea of what the text looked like in the earliest form. Someone, yes. <coughs> Josiah is virtually the successor of Manasseh. 
So those, the, you know, the pious circles, the monotheistic circles, uh, the high priest, and they, they seem to want to undertake some kind of effort of reform. So what they, I, I think what they've done in the Book of Deuteronomy is to shape, to, to take older traditions, yes, but to shape them and to invent some new ideas of their own. For example, the idea that the only place you can legitimately sacrifice is the temple in Jerusalem, which certainly served the purposes of the reformers. It meant that you, know, you could no longer have people committing idolatry and, and the backyard shrine because they couldn't worship in the backyard shrine. And you, you, know, you took pretty stern efforts to get rid of all the popular outside Jerusalem shrines. So I think it, it's, yes, some of it was pre-existing, but it's really quite pointed, quite carefully shaped in the interests of this reform effort. Yes? I have a question. Um, since, since the people during that time, the greater mass of the population couldn't read, um, would it be fair to assume that the written word becoming the Torah and the Bible was more uh, established in order to establish sort of the ground rules and the power shaki among the prophets and the priests and the rulers because they were the only ones at the time that in effect could actually read and a lot of what you quoted oftentimes there revolved around the positioning of the power between them. That's an interesting question. I, certainly, and when you know, even in antiquity, even when we've got written texts, most people receive those texts by hearing them. And Deuteronomy provides for its own reading. It's to be read once every seven years during the, the Feast of Booths. So it imagines itself being read out loud. Josiah has it read. Ezra reads the Torah. Nehemiah says, you know, I, we, um, on, on that day, um, I found in the book of the Torah, it was, it was found. Um, um, so uh, I, I, mean, I think there is a public aspect to it. And I think that, you know, knowing it, even if you can't read the text yourself, knowing that it's, it's there in that text, I think is, is significant for people. But certainly, um, you know, these texts couldn't have gotten written if they didn't reflect the, the interests of the elite who had the ability to, to, to read and write. What I think is remarkable, and I, I said this before, but I, I mean, I'm, I'm always you know, really struck by it, is um, Deuteronomy does appear, you, know, it's, it's, you can see what might be in it for Hilkiah the high priest, I and mean, it does make the temple in Jerusalem the only place people sacrifice, it does you know, increase his power in a way. What was in it for Josiah? I mean, I, you know, I really, I really think you have to feel that um, you know, he was committed to this reform for some reason that went beyond mere self-interest in that case. So, you know, I mean, I think, I think you're right. It must reflect their interests. Um, on the other hand, they're, they're not always entirely self-interested. I think that's pretty clear. But isn't there, doesn't it say that Josiah was still a kid? When he came to power, he was eight years old when his father was assassinated. But by the time of Deuteronomy, he is, in 622, he is, I, he's in his 20s by then. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.